Hello, and God bless everyone. Uh, this is Father Mikhail, or Father Michael, and uh, today's talk or reflection is on the pan heresy of ecumenism and our struggle against it. So as you saw at the beginning with the, the little quote from Metropolitan Filaret, who uh, is still going through the process of, uh, of being canonized, um, is that ecumenism is the heresy of heresies. And it wants to completely wipe out the, tr uh, the concept of the Orthodox Church as the guardian of truth and create some kind of new strange church. And so he's in this, this was taken from, from a homily. And if you want to see uh, a more full text of the homily, it's on Gregory de Capolite's uh, YouTube channel, um, in which he has the full, a more full text of, of what he's saying. But basically there was this ecumenical meeting with a proto-priest uh, from the Paris Theological School, along with a Jewish rabbi and a Roman Catholic priest. And this rabbi said in their midst, that the Lord was the son, the Lord Jesus Christ, was the son of an illegitimate, dissolute woman. Lord have mercy. What, uh, what absolute garbage. You know, that is, uh, you know, an offense to our Lord. That is an offense to his holy mother, whom he chose, you know, to take his, his uh, you know, to, to come into the world through whom he was incarnated by. And the worst part of this was that a man had asked the proto-priest, how could you keep silent? And the priest simply stated it was because he didn't want to offend the Jew. Dear ones, we live in a world that is rife with this concept of having to be politically correct to accept secularist and worldly things as absolute moral truths and absolute moral goods. There is only one truth, and there is only one who is absolutely good. And when we're, you know, as Christians, we're supposed to love those who are not Christians. Yes, we are supposed to be loving. But that doesn't mean that we simply keep silent and that we don't bear witness to our faith. You know, when, when the martyrs were executed for not worshiping pagan gods, do you think that they cared about the feelings of the pagans when they told them that their gods were demons? No. And, and, and I say to, to anyone who asks me, well, are you saying that, uh, that the God of Islam is not the same God that we worship? No, he's clearly not. You know, or when people say, well, would you tell a Hindu uh, that they worship demons? Yes, I would. And the desire to tell the truth should come from a desire to love another person properly. And if you love someone and respect them, you should never lie to them. You know, there, there is a way to be gentle, but there is also a way to approach things in that you do not compromise. And that is what the pan-heresy of ecumenism is. It is a raw compromise and the attempt to, of the, the attempted disillusion of the truth. Um, Father Seraphim Rose has written extensively about this in his book, Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future. I highly recommend um, if you're an inquirer or if you are an Orthodox Christian, you haven't read this, to, to try and pick up a copy and read it. It's by uh, St. Herman of Alaska uh, Brotherhood. It's, it's their, uh, their printing press. Um, Honestly, uh, with Father Seraphim Rose's popularity, you could type it in and, and you could find it on a Google search. So I, I highly recommend uh, picking up a copy of this incredible book that Father Seraphim Rose wrote. It is almost prophetic. Um, and he breaks down the issue of ecumenism in the Roman Catholic Church, how we see um, you know, concepts such as yoga and, and Hindu worship practices, which yoga is. You know, as, as an Orthodox Christian, should you do yoga? The short answer is absolutely not. Never. Um, you, you should not engage in something that is modeled after the, the worship or meant to worship and bring uh, these people into communion with their demonic uh, false gods. So ecumenism. Ecumenism, of course, doesn't just extend to, uh, towards the heathens, but even towards heretical sects, to, to the sectarians such as Protestants and Papal Protestants, to Roman Catholics. Um, the very notion that St. Paul warns us about 
in terms of not accepting a false gospel, a false teaching, is what we find with any heresy. It, it is a way of reinterpreting the gospel, a way of reinterpreting what the apostles has handed down. And it is uh, either reconvening them to be more culturally appropriate to the audience that, that it's trying to appeal to, or to appeal to the passions and tastes of the people who have founded that religion. Um, you know, I live in Canada, and so there's there's this thing called the United Church of Canada. And I'm not going to be soft and gentle in, in how I'll describe this church. It is satanic. It is purely heretical. And this church, they, they will perform uh, gay marriages, and they will ordain females to be ministers. And my wife and I passed by this church the other day when we were visiting our hometown. And it said, be proud of who you are on the sign outside. Take pride in who you are. Be proud of yourself. And just the way it was presented, just the way it's worded, and especially with understanding the notion uh, of, of the, you know, of the gay pride. And, and of course, when with us Christians, us Orthodox Christians, we should be alarmed when we hear this word because pride, of course, is, is the sin by which Lucifer fell and the most difficult passion uh, out of many passions to uproot in a person. And so it is, it is this notion of intellectual pride, of personal individualization, uh, and, and the pride that comes from it that oftentimes drives ecumenism. You know, it's this idea that we don't want to offend these people. We don't want to break their pride. We don't want to tell them that what they don't believe in is true. So what are we going to say? Well, you know, we, we have even some Orthodox hierarchs who are supposed to be the shepherds of their communities, shepherding souls and taking care of large diasporas, saying uh, absolute nonsense that all religions are pathways leading up the same mountain and that uh, dogmas and doctrines are just rocks and boulders blocking their view of the top. Well, uh, my only response to that is, is that statement, that ecumenistic heresy that this hierarch holds is a pretty massive boulder and I think it, it hit him on the head. And, and I think it's distorted him and may God correct him and have mercy on him and bring him to his senses. Um, you know, so we, we have to realize that what ecumenism is, is nothing short of a Masonic agenda. The Freemasons hold this view that, you know, you can be a member of their brotherhood, all you have to do is believe in a higher power. And we see similar talk now in Alcoholics Anonymous, which has done a lot to help people recover from a terrible addiction. But this whole belief, just saying that you have to have a belief in a higher power and depersonalizing who is the creator and subtracting from the truth of the person of Christ is a problem. And we have to realize that Christ is one person. He is one hypostasis with two nature. He's not as Nestorius claimed, uh, you know, to be a, a man who was then possessed by the Logos. And the problem with this view, this ecumenistic view of the Orthodox Church that, that some heretics have, is that it attacks and even does insult to the incarnation of Christ. And that the Christ, Christ is the Theanthropos, he is the God-man, and the church is the Theanthropic vine, as, as I believe St. Eustin Popovich said. And we have to realize that just as Christ has two natures, as I discussed in my last video on baptism, the church has two natures. The church is, you know, an institution that is both human and divine. It's not exclusively divine, it's not monophysite, and it's not exclusively human, it's not Nestorian. And the problem with the ecumenical movement, the real danger there, uh, as Vladimir Lasky described it, is it, it's semi-Nestorian. And it's this belief somehow that all churches are the same. But that isn't the case. You know, we see warnings again amongst the apostles not, not to partake with heretics, not to pray with heretics, um, you know, to hold fast to the traditions that we have been handed down by the apostles, whether it's by their written epistle or word of mouth. And in keeping with the unity of the faith, we maintain that oneness, that, that communion with the church as a whole. And, and so when, when we see different strange doctrines popping up and, and the denial of the mysteries of Christ, or in certain cases with certain Protestant sects, even the denial of the three persons of the Trinity, 
we, we end up having a problem. These people are teaching another gospel. They're reinterpreting the gospel to be something that it is not. We have to remember, dear ones, that Christ is a person, and that person has made himself evidently and clearly synonymous with his church. We see that when he stops Saul on the road to Damascus, and he says, Saul, why do you persecute me? He doesn't say, why do you persecute my churches? Why do you persecute my communities? He says, why do you persecute me? And this is because, as it is said in John 6, we who are in the true church, we have the Eucharist. We have access to the body and blood of Christ. And we partake of this, God willing, every single Sunday at the very least. And in doing so, what does Christ promise to those who, who eats his flesh and drinks his blood? He says, I will abide in him and he in me and I will raise him up on the last day. And we have to realize, dear ones, that th this is an indication of who has the truth in, in that the Holy Fathers indicate who has the right to consecrate Holy Communion. St. Cyprian of Carthage wisely pointed out in his dispute with the Novitians and in his refutation of Pope Stephen's decision to, re uh, to receive them via chrismation, those, that is, who were born into the Novitian sect or who had been baptized into it. And he said, you know, th th this is just a vain, uh, you know, this is just pagan water. This is just a vain washing. This is not a legitimate baptism by which they've been received. And there was a lot of back and forth with him and Pope Stephen on this. But where Pope Stephen contradicted himself is that he agreed that their ordinations were invalid because they weren't in communion with the church. And as a result, that they couldn't even consecrate Holy Communion. And we believe this in the Orthodox Church. This is why we practice closed communion. We take the words of St. Paul in 1 Corinthians seriously, where he warns that this is why some people have fallen asleep or died. And, it, and this is due to the unworthy reception of Holy Communion. So Holy Communion is not just a symbol. It's not just an idea or uh, an outward little nice memorial service. It, it is a reality. It is a present, ongoing reality that is timeless. You know, when you go to the Orthodox Church and partake in the Divine Liturgy, you are present with Christ, with the Apostles, with the Saints, and you are partaking of the same Last Supper. The communion is the same every single time, throughout all time. It is the body and blood of Christ. It remains so. The problem with ecumenism is that it dissolves that notion. It, it dissolves everything into this strange uh, one gray mass where there is no truth, where everything is just a notion of truth. And what you have now is the worship of an idea, you know, and this is a denial of the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. You know, when we look at Acts chapter 15, what did the apostles say? It seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit when they make their decision at the Council of Jerusalem. And so we know from that, that there is only one church and that the church is guided infallibly, despite what some out there might say, by the councils. The councils, the ecumenical councils of the church are infallible. And were the teachings and writings of the saints, the elders, and the contemporary fathers of the church, and I apologize, you can probably hear my, my teething son screaming in the background, um, he's, he's not in a very good mood, <laughs> uh, but where the, te where, where the teachings of the saints, the fathers of the church are infallible is found in the patristic consensus it, where we see, you know, there are times where saints disagree with one another. There are times where certain fathers hold certain ideas that other fathers don't, and they're both saints, but where the truth lies is in their consensus. And that is where we can see the Holy Spirit revealing the truth to them and working through them. And so, you know, what the ecumenists do is they deny that. They deny the working of the Holy Spirit by denying that we are the guardians of the truth. We are. You know, to wrap up this video, why don't we, we look at some of the apostolic canons and their cautionings? Because it's very clear from the apostolic canons that the church in the earliest of its days had laid out where the church is and is not, where we can obtain salvation and where we're in danger of losing it. And bear in mind, excommunication is not necessarily a punishment, but is meant to be therapeutic, reparative, and corrective. So with that in mind, the 10th Apostolic Canon, if anyone shall pray even in, pri in a private house with an excommunicated person, 
let him also be excommunicated. Now, <clears throat> many of us have friends and family who, who are from heterodox confessions. Um, that being said, I, I do avoid praying with, uh, with family members of mine who are not of the Orthodox faith. Because why? Because there will be error there. You know, um, in the 46th canon, we ordain that a bishop or presbyter who has admitted the baptism or sacrifice of heretics, meaning that they've admitted them, accepted them as true, be deposed. For what concord does Christ have with Belial, Or what pact hath a believer with an infidel? And what this is saying is, what does Christ have to do with the devil? What does the light have to do with the darkness? You know, there, there is, you're either in the bridal chamber, you're either in the, the wedding feast, and you're wearing a feastal robe, your baptismal robe, or you're out in the darkness. And that being said, while we're here in this life, you have time to come to the truth. But there's only one truth. There's only one church. You know, there's not a, a multiplicity of religions as a certain, uh, as a certain individual who, uh, you know, uh, well, we'll name him as the Pope of Rome said. You know, God doesn't will a multiplicity of religions. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that all who may believe in him shall be saved. And what does this mean? Well, that we believe in him and we follow him. Not that we just mentally ascend to him. Not that we just hold nice ideas and try to treat each other, you know, nicely. It's not about being a nice guy. It's about doing what is higher, about following who is holy, about following Christ. That's what it's about. You know, so we have to be cautious of this, of this notion. And lastly, the 65th canon. If any clergyman or layman shall enter into a synagogue of the Jews or heretics to pray, let the former be deposed and let the latter be excommunicated. So what does that tell us? We shouldn't be entering into uh, papal masses or inviting papists to partake of communion with us. Uh, they can't. And though the papists will say that, well, we Orthodox are valid you know, in their books, so we can have communion as long as it's cool with our bishops, what Orthodox bishop in his right mind would allow a baptized, chrismated Orthodox Christian to commune with the papists, that would be a self-excommunication. And so if you are an Orthodox Christian and you've been attempting Catholic churches because you think it's all the same, stop. It's not. Okay? Christ is not a polygamist. Christ has one bride. Uh, Christ is the head of the church, and a head sits atop one body. <clears throat> he does, it, you know, such such an idea of a head sitting on multiple bodies is an abomination. Uh, Canon thirty two of the Regional Council of Laodicea: the blessings of heretics are curses. <clears throat> so there you see, dear ones, the church has uh, many other canons detailing this. Um, we even see in the life of St. Paisios that uh, a Catholic, uh, a priest, had come to, uh, to his hermitage. And, uh, you know, he reveals that God did not tell him anything about him, that he hadn't heard anything of him. <clears throat> but because this elder was illumined, he could see that the man did not possess the priesthood. And he told him to put on his beretta, which is the hat that... Catholic priests are entitled to wear. Um, you know, we have our scufia, they have their beretta. And what happened with this man is his name was, this Catholic priest was named Bonaventure. And he would go and try to blend in wherever he was, you know, amongst the Greeks. He would dress as a Greek Orthodox priest. And amongst the Russians, he would dress as a Russian Orthodox priest. You know, he had his, his beard long and everything. But St. Paisios could see that he didn't have the grace of, of the priesthood. So what does that tell us? That the pan-heresy of ecumenism is a grand lie. There is no such thing as separate branches. There is no such thing as an ordination, a baptism, a Eucharist, and anything outside of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And what is that church? The Eastern Orthodox Church. The church that is kept to the apostolic deposit of faith uh, to, to the canons handed down through the seven ecumenical councils and to the traditions handed down to us by the apostles and their heirs. So, dear ones, do not be deceived. Be aware of the noetic wolf who is prowling to, to devour his prey. And 
I highly recommend, again, reading um, Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future by Father Seraphim Rose and Against False Union by Alexander Kelamiros, which is available through St. Nectarius Press, uh, to both of which I will include links in the description. And lastly, dear ones, but certainly not least, um, our friend Subdeacon Nectarios at, uh, you know, has designed and put up this wonderful website, which is petitioning for the canonization of the saintly Metropolitan Filaret, who is a staunch defender of the truth and was a staunch opponent of the heterodox and uh, teaching of the pan-heresy of ecumenism. And so I, I encourage you, dear ones, he has 410 signatures, last I checked. Uh, he's looking to get 500, very doable. Uh, to whoever is watching this video, please check out the website, sign the petition, and, and let us and let God in his merciful will, and if it, if it be within the will of God, add to the number of saints that we commemorate in the church and that we would see Metropolitan Filaret added to their number. So may God grant this. May God bless all of you. And please, again, remember to check out the website to sign the petition. And uh, may God bless you and keep you all.